Role modeling for me, it is the most powerful, it is the most valuable, and the most important thing we can do as an organization. Go to your leader first. If you don't know who to call or your leader's not able to help you, you call me and I will uh, either give you advice on how to fix your, or fix your situation or I'll get involved in helping fix your situation or I'll listen to what you have to say. This episode is brought to you in part by TSE Certified Sales Training Program. The program is to challenge sales reps to teach them the fundamentals and to help them become consistent at closing deals. To find out more about the program, go to thesalesevangelist.com slash course. This episode is also brought to you in part by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial. Simply go to audibletrial.com slash TSE. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to another great episode of the Sales Evangelist Podcast. I'm your host, Donald Kelly, the Sales Evangelist, and I'm so excited for another great episode. I'm so excited to be here with you today. And on this episode, we're going to take a different approach towards our sales game. We're going to focus on how we can create amazing customer experiences and how that's going to help us close more deals. You're probably saying, well, Donald, I'm not in the marketing department. I don't give a care if you're in marketing or if you're in sales or you're in the dishwashing department. You need to make sure you understand this simple concept of creating experiences. And you can do that in small ways. We're going to cover that today. And none other than Dan Cockrell himself, a former Walt Disney World executive, to give us his insight. He's been there from the ground of doing the parking lot attendant all the way up to the boardroom. So he knows and breathes experiences. Listen to what he has to say on how you can improve your game and to close more deals in the process. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks, Donald. I'm excited to be here to uh, speak with you today. Man, I'm looking forward to having you. I know we're going to have a great discussion because this is something that I feel that many people don't necessarily think about too much, but how creating great customer experiences can help you close more deals. And coming from your past and your experience, you're all about that, right? Creating that background. So I kind of bragged about you a little bit in a teaser, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about you and what you do, Dan? Yeah. So I went to, my dad was in the hospitality industry. And so I grew up in hospitality. I went to Boston University and then ended up working at Disney World in college for a summer. And when I graduated from college, I headed back down and joined the Walt Disney Company in 1991 as a parking attendant at Epcot and stayed for 26 years. And I left last May to start my own consulting company on service and leadership and kind of sharing the, everything I learned in 26 years and 19 different jobs working at uh, the Walt Disney Company. Amazing, dude. Congratulations on that. That's, a, that's an awesome career. And also just like the simple, the sheer fact that you knew from ground up about everything about almost everything about that organization because you did almost every role. <laughs> yeah, that's not an uncommon story at Disney. If you talk to most of the executives there, at least that work in operations and a lot of other areas, most of us started in frontline roles. And I think it's really important in that company that you understand what the actual customer experience is at the ground level. Because as I say, that's where the magic happens. You know, that's where people make their decisions on whether they're going to come back again it's whether they make their decisions on whether the vacation was a great value or not. And so when you work those frontline roles, it really impresses upon you that. So when you get into more senior roles later in your career, you don't forget about where you're really kind of, it's all coming together. Love it, man. And so this is why you guys are at Disney, I say you guys, no longer with Disney, but the Disney is all about creating experiences. Can you speak to that for a little bit? And it is, about that philosophy and how you guys come about that and why is that so key? Sure. You know, it's funny. I mean, Walt Disney was way ahead of his time. And, you know, his original thought was, you know, he was a movie guy. He made animated films and cartoons. And he came up with this idea that he wanted to create a 3D world where people could escape reality and step into the movies and create happiness together and be together as a family. And that was the original thought when he built Disneyland in 1955. 
And I think his, his original thing about business was keep it clean, be nice to people, give them a good value, and they'll keep coming back. And you know, it was good meat and potatoes, Midwestern values that kind of started the company. And I think we've understood that as time has gone on, we've understood the fact that people are looking for experiences. And even more than ever, I see a lot of the millennials now, and I hate to stereotype for good or bad, but a lot of it is true. You know, my son is a millennial and he looks for experiences. He's not looking for a big house. And there's a lot of things he and his girlfriend aren't looking to buy. They want to get experiences because as I've seen, and I think our guests see at Walt Disney World, when you buy objects, they're really exciting to get, but they lose value over time. Experiences gain value over time. The stories you tell later. And if at Disney, if we can make those emotional connections with people and have a great product and service to offer them simultaneously, it is just a, it's a business model that can't fail. And we just keep honing in on that. What kind of experience can we create for you? We talk about it every single day. I was in a meeting one time and I met a guy from Amtrak and we were talking about culture. And he said, yeah, we are big on safety at Amtrak. He said, every meeting starts with us talking about, we figure out who knows CPR in the room, the meeting, where all the exits to the building are, if there's a fire and what we're going to do in an emergency. We start every meeting like that. And of course, I said, well, wow, that's a really strange cultural thing. He said, what do you talk about at the beginning of meetings? I said, we talk about magical moments. He goes, well, that's not any less weird than talking about safety. But the point is, it's, it, has to be, it has to be something that's in your culture that you're discussing all the time. And that's what we do at Disney. Every day we're telling stories about cast members who've created experiences for, for guests. We make them heroes. We share those stories so other people can learn how to do it. And that's, I'd say, when they, people say, what's the secret to Disney's success? I think creating experiences is really why the parks are so popular. You know, that's so true. And I can tell you, we, we just had a friend, Stephen Hart, and he's been a past guest on a podcast. He took his family. He was down at Podcast Movement a couple of weeks ago. So then they decided to wrap their family trip around that. So his wife and kids came down end of the week and they had a Disney experience. So then he went ahead and shared some of the pictures and he shared one of, a picture of his son fighting Darth Vader you know, with the, the lightsaber and, and dude was just like so in love. And the pictures, it was just like, it brought us into it. And like you're saying, it was, he said in his post, I don't have it exactly, but it's something to the nature of, you know, my son put in his name, had a, an experience of his lifetime that he'll never forget. And I probably can get Stephen's permission and put that in our show notes. But it was pretty amazing that how that tied together and that alone, I mean, that thing there, they didn't take back per se, maybe they bought a lightsaber, but they didn't take that physical thing back, that fight. It was a picture, it was a memory, and it was an experience. So those work, and that's it's true. And I, I validate that to be 100%. So love it, man. Mission accomplished. <laughs> so now I'm a sales rep listening to this call. I'm an entrepreneur, or I'm a, a sales leader. And I'm thinking, well, how can I get that and put it in towards my B2B sales experience? What can I do to create or formulate experiences? Any thoughts on what we can go about doing to make that happen? Yes. And it's funny. I was, I'm going to go back to a quick story. Back, my wife and I both worked at uh, Disneyland Paris in the early 90s. We opened the park over there and spent five years over there. And at one point, we decided, okay, we're going to make a change and we're going to move back to the United States. And I'd been di with Disney for five years and I really enjoyed the company, but I really didn't have a lot of exposure to other industries. So, I looked around a little bit. I sent out some resumes just to, in my mind, confirm Disney was the place to be. And at the end of the day, I really did you know, stay with them, obviously. But I talked to a gentleman who was in sales and he sold uh, uh, diningware and silverware and to hotels. And he was a really great sales guy. And I talked to him at one point and he said, you know, have you ever considered sales? I said, well, look, I'm an operations guy. I don't do sales. I'm not, I wouldn't be good at sales. And he said, well, I always ask that question because he said, Dan, everybody's in sales. He said, you're in sales. He said, every day you are selling ideas. You're trying to get your team. You're selling them why they should be doing certain things and you're selling them on certain behaviors. And he was absolutely right because what I've discovered in my job is, you know, anyone can get to about 70 or 80% of their performance just by us holding them accountable and having rules and regulations and standards and policies. The rest of that 20% is discretionary effort. And what I found out in my job in the sales role I was in in operations 
if I was able to tell the right stories and sell my ideas to my 12,000 cast members at Magic Kingdom, they would be willing to unlock that extra 20% of effort. So we're all in sales. And I think that connection's there. So to get back more particular to your question, we did a survey with our guests really trying to, we do tons of research at Disney. I mean, we know how many people, the average people per boat at Pirates of the Caribbean per hour, every day of every hour that attraction's open. We have lots of measurement. So we talk to our guests a lot and we do round tables and we do focus groups and we do surveys. And one year we pulled a group of guests together and we said, we really want to understand what makes us different. Why do you keep coming back to Walt Disney World? What is it for you that differentiates what we do? And we expected to hear, we love the fireworks. We love your hotels. We love the cleanliness. We love your characters. We love your attractions. We love the food. I mean, there's a laundry list of reasons people want to go to Walt Disney World. But there's lots of vacation destinations, right? I mean, there's Hawaii, there's Tahiti, there's France. I mean, you know, we're competing with every other vacation destination in the world. And so what we concluded was they told us what they wanted but we were able to kind of tease out what they needed. And what they told us once we started really honing in by some very smart researchers, they said, you know, we want all that, but there's really four things we really need. And I think this is what salespeople and people at Walt Disney World have in common. And the first thing was make me feel special. Our guest told us when we come to Walt Disney World, we need you to make us feel special because we know the way you do your marketing and your commercials, we see the magic. And we want to feel that way. And so you need to find ways to make us feel special. So whether that's making sure you have the time for Darth Vader to have a lightsaber fight with our son, or we're (laughs) celebrating a birthday, or we're celebrating a life, you know, we have people come celebrate their end of life at Walt Disney World, we need you to make us feel special. And so we translate to our cast members and we give them pretty wide berth to empower them to do these kind of things. And we talk about their common purpose. And we say, you know, your role, your job may be custodial. It may be a vice president. It may be a chef. It may be an accountant. But then the day, our common purpose is making sure we're creating happiness. So we always are looking for, and we challenge our cast every day, how do you make guests feel special? And we create birthday buttons. We try to find out more about our guests through technology and then turn that around to create magic for them. We'll make a comment on their baseball hat or their princesses. If, if there's a little girl has her dress on, we call her Halo Princess Welcome. So we're always looking for how can we make every guest feel special in their own way. And when you're entertaining 50 million guests a year, that's extremely challenging. But we have 74,000 cast members also who all hear about this every day. So I would say in sales is how do you make your potential client or a, a, an existing client how do you make them feel special? And a lot of it is common sense. You know, do you remember their birthdays? Do you remember if something big happens in their company? Do you send them a note and say, hey, I just saw this. Congratulations on your new acquisition. Do you, how much personally do you know about them? So a lot of this, you know, it's an investment. You have to have an investment in time with them or you need to use technology, but you can be very creative and think about the ways to make people feel special. Number two, the guests have told us, I need you to treat me as an individual. When you're interacting with me, and I have a request, don't give me the answer. You're going to give all 20 million other guests at Magic King that that come every year. Look at me as an individual. If I have a son or a daughter or a family member who has a disability, make them, treat them individually. Go ahead and connect with them individually. If we get to one of your, the California Grill, one of your gourmet restaurants, and my son wants chicken nuggets, figure it out. Get Go find the chicken nuggets for us. So, these individual things that we do, these exceptions we make, and what we've discovered at Disney, as long as it doesn't put the guest safety in, at risk, we can make exceptions for almost everything. And we do it all the time because we know that if we treat people as individuals, they're going to see that and they're going to be more likely to come back. Because how many times a day do you hear of people, that's not the policy, we're not allowed to do that, I can't do that. There's very few things you can't do in business. You just choose not to do it. I'll use an example. I was at Epcot last night with a couple, my wife and a, a couple of friends of ours. And I had uh, booked a reservation at the Japan Pavilion. And we decided we weren't going to go because the Food Mind Festival is going. And we decided, you know, this will be more fun. So I called the reservation center to cancel the reservation. And you put a $25 deposit down at Disney to, to secure your reservation. 
And I called and I said, look, we made a last minute change. The food and wine festival is happening. We decided we're going to just go around the world and eat in all the pavilions and all the kiosks. I'd like to cancel my reservation. So she took the number. She took my name. She said, it's canceled. You're all set. And I was ready. I was just ready for her to say, well, you too late by now. We're going to charge you $25 for it. But there they have a policy, I think, and, or she made the decision on her own. You know what? This guy's going to spend much more money than that at Epcot. We're not going to charge him for that. The policy is you have to put $25 down. The decision she was able to make after hearing what my reason was, was to give me a break there. So as sales individuals, are you treating people as individuals? Don't quote them your policy, work with them, figure it out and make the exceptions to, to make them feel as individuals. So uh, number three is respect. Good, John. Dan, I want to hit up on those two so far because you're, you're just like cooking with some fire here, man. And I love it. And I love the stories. I love the experiences. Here's what I've seen so far from what you're telling me. All of this stuff, it doesn't seem like it costs hundreds or thousands of dollars to do. It's not like I need to go buy some brand new software. Maybe you could get, you know, in your CRM, whatever you have, you probably could put somebody's birthday in there. But it just, it seems like it's the little things. And I, as a sales rep, I've often tried to look at, well, we need to do a, a huge overhaul program. But everything you're telling me that you guys are doing at Disney, it seemed like it's just not expensive stuff that's making the bigger experience. Am I off on that? No, you nailed it. It's funny. We have an organization called Disney Institute, and we bring in companies from all over the world to give them a look inside Disney and how we work. And when they get there, they're ready for like, all right, I paid a lot of money here. Show me the book that you hide in the safe that has the big secret of how you're successful. <laughs> and we spend a week with them and we tell them everything we do. And they come out and they say, well, you didn't tell me anything I didn't know. We say, well, then you just have to have the discipline to do this. Because, and my wife has a great quote that she's trained me to use a lot. She says, it's very simple, but it's not easy. Don't confuse simple with easy. And this takes work and it takes paying attention to the details. And it takes, you can't write a, a standard operating procedure to tell people how to authentically make a, a connection with people. You just have to hire people that enjoy doing this, are good at doing this, are taking interest in people. And to your point, when I do speeches and talk about this, I, right off the bat, I tell people, look, what I'm going to tell you today, you're going to say, oh yeah, the Disney guy's here. Disney has unlimited resources. They have everything in the world. My company is smaller. I can't do what you're going to say. And I tell them, Everything I'm going to tell you has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do. It just has to do with your leadership. And if you want to decide to be great and by being great to take these steps. And it's to your point, it's all about behaviors. And the only things it costs is training and hiring the right people. So I think you nailed that. Hey, I know it's getting really good, but we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, Dan's going to pick up where he left off and continue to outline some of the best things that you can do, the small, simple things to create amazing customer experiences. You're listening to the Sales Evangelist podcast, and I'm your host, Donald Kelly, the Sales Evangelist. I kind of got into sales by accident, but... Still yet, not really. My family are Jamaicans, and we've been selling ever since I was a kid. So I knew I wanted to do something related to that. My friends, however, in college told me, you have a great personality, you should go into sales. And I did. Now, B2C selling was amazing. I made some pretty good money. But when I got into B2B selling, it was difficult. And no matter if you are an accidental seller or you want to do this since you were born, if you don't have the proper training, you're not going to succeed. So I didn't. Luckily, I got help. I had the passion, the drive. Now I knew exactly what to do and I started to thrive. This is why I created TSC Certified Sales Training Program because there are many of you just like me who didn't have the right training but had a desire. TSC Certified Sales Training Program will teach you all of the fundamentals you need to really thrive and to be successful as a seller. Join our group coaching program. We would love to have you. Find all the details in the show notes or go to thesalesevangelist.com slash course. Again, thesalesevangelist.com slash course. This episode is also brought to you in part by Audible. Audible has hundreds and thousands of titles of books for you to choose from, from fiction to how-to to sales books. One of the books I'm listening to right now is Sales Management Simplified by Mike Weinberg. I'm telling you, the book is amazing. I highly recommend you check it out. Get the book for free and also a 30-day free trial of Audible. Simply go to audibletrial.com 
dot com slash T S E. Again, audibletrial.com slash T S E. Hey, we're back, and Dan and I are going to finish up our conversation. He's going to continue to outline a few more ideas that you can do. I mean, things you can take and apply today as a sales rep to help you create amazing customer experiences and naturally close more deals. I feel also one of the things that you shared at the very beginning is the mindset as well. If you, so if the company's mindset is on safety, then everything is going to be about safety. And if the company's mindset is on experience and everything's going to be about experience and people are going to look for ways to do it, you're going to be rewarded based on experiences. So let me give you another example like I'm thinking about in, and maybe you can correct me and maybe this is something you guys do in your program, but it seems like if it's not happening at the top, it's not likely going to expand throughout the organization. Is that off? No, you could do this podcast by yourself, Donald. I think this is, you, you got it right. <laughs> Role modeling. Role modeling for me, it is the most powerful. It is the most valuable and the most important thing we could do as an organization. So to your point, at when I was a vice president at Magic Kingdom, I ate almost every meal in the cafeteria with the cast members. I didn't have my entourage with me. I sat down, I chatted with them. I met new cast members. I introduced myself. I asked them how their experience was going. I spent time in the park every day, walking around, talking to cast, asking them how they were doing, seeing if I could help them. I had a confidential voicemail number, so any cast member at Magic Kingdom could call me directly. Now, I wasn't looking to solve every problem at the Magic Kingdom, but I told people, go to your leader first. If you don't know who to call or your leader's not able to help you, you call me and I will either give you advice on how to fix your, or fix your situation or I'll get involved in helping fix your situation or I'll listen to what you have to say. Now, once I put that promise, I had to make sure I followed through. And the first person I didn't call back, you know, the, my credibility was shattered. But if I could not role model and show this to my cast members, I hardly could expect them to do it for our guests. And I like to say, you know, people can't be what they can't see. And so they need role models. They need people that are taking that extra step. And once they can see that, it motivates them to say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And then we find the superstar cast members who create these incredible moments, like the Darth Vader one. If I guarantee you, like if I heard that when I was at Disney and got a letter, that cast member would have got a signed note from me congratulating them on that. We would have put a video up on it. And we would have told that story to all the Magic Kingdom. So in the future, people knew, you know what? You have to have every interaction with a character should take one minute and 30 seconds. But if you have an opportunity to do something extra with a, a child, it's okay. And you can break the rule and go longer because it's going to create that interaction. So you're absolutely right. It's, it doesn't cost much. And role modeling, if leadership can't do it, then I just feel as a leader, I can't ask my team to do that either. Yeah, because, you know, one of the things that I thought about coming into this interview, Dan, I was like, man, Dan's going to give me so many other cool ideas about stuff. But I feel that it's impossible. It's impossible to come up with millions, with all these different options of how you can help somebody to feel special or how you can treat somebody, show how to treat somebody as an individual, but the birthdays or someone's or, you know, sending them. I have two thank you cards on my desk right now going out in the mail because, and they're handwritten. So it's not like the, you know, print stuff that I'm sending out to two new coaching clients because I know that little thing goes a long way for me. So I'm just sending that to them. But it's a, it's a small gesture, but there are many different other gestures that I probably could do, right? And, but it's impossible to really contemplate that. I think it probably would come down to an exercise as an organization once you figure out what is our overall goal, then as a sales team to say, these are some ways that we feel that we can best implement some great experiences. Yeah. I mean, I call that empowerment. You bring everyone together, you tell them what the goal is, you tell them what they're allowed to do, you tell them that we're going to give you full range to be creative and you turn them loose. And, you know, obviously a thousand people or 10 people are going to come up with more ideas than one person. So as a leader, I didn't have to know what the ideas were. I just had to make sure everyone knew that my priority was to make those things happen and I was going to support them as fully as I could. And then you start looking for people and people start stepping up and they start coming up. And, you know, I could do a five hour podcast on all the incredible moments I've seen. I mean, you know, the custodial <laughs> cast members, their job is to sweep the trash and empty the trash cans. That's what their job is. But somehow, if you go to Walt Disney World today, you'll run into a cast member who comes out for 10 minutes a day and there's a bunch of them 
and they'll fill up their pan with water and they'll take their broom and they will draw a Disney character on the ground in water. In Florida, they'll stay for 10 minutes because it evaporates. But our custodial cast members are artists. We didn't come up with that. They came up with the idea that they could do something like this. And all of a sudden, you're creating these incredible moments for people. And that wasn't an executive's idea. That was just us saying, figure out a way to create magic. And even the custodial cast said, we want to get involved. And, and that's what's happening now. So yeah, the ideas are endless. But as a leader, you just got to make sure you let everyone know that they have permission to go for it. What is number three on your list? Yeah. So number three, another basic one is uh, respect me. When I come to Walt Disney World, if I'm staying at a value resort for $99 a night, or I'm staying at the Grand Floridian for $1,200 a night, I want you to respect me. I'm still a guest there. I respect my, my family, no matter where I'm from in the world, what color I am, what language I speak, make me feel welcome and respect the fact that I'm there spending my money. And if I ask you the question that we get a lot, what time is the three o'clock parade? Don't roll your eyes and give me a, an answer like it's at three o'clock because I'm not asking you what time the parade is. I'm asking you where I need to be at three o'clock to see the parade because it goes through the park. And so, dude, so sorry, I'm sorry to cut you off. That there, man, you guys read between the lines. I love it. I love that so much. <laughs> yeah. Because so you go places and you know, the classic one is the IT guy that comes in your office and he's like, yeah, this was what we were doing wrong. You should have put this and you're like, dude, I don't know anything about what you're doing. <laughs> and you're making me feel like a really idiot, which I know is your goal. Once again, our goal is go ahead and make people feel good. And just because we live at Walt Disney World and we know everything that's going on doesn't mean you should. And so we've got to respect people for that. If you're, if you're little, I had a few go-tos. One was when I'd see a little, you know, a three or four-year-old having the huge meltdown, which happened pretty frequently because the family's like, we're getting up at 6 a.m. and we're going to bed at midnight and we're going to see everything and there'll be no naps. And after the third day, they're like, all right, that was not a good idea. <laughs> um, but you see that meltdown happening and you see mom and dad and they're just like, oh God, my kid's screaming, we're hot, everyone's looking at us. I'd always go up and I'd, <laughs> I'd love to tell them, hey, that's pretty impressive, but I have to brag a little bit. My daughter could scream twice as loud as that and go for three hours. So you keep working on that. And they would just have that moment, would give them a break. And they're like, okay, they understand, you know, and... um I had another really good one. I usually don't qu think really quickly on my feet necessarily when it comes to humor. But I was, I, when I was the vice president of Hollywood Studios, I ran into some guests in the park and they were kind of looking around. It was like the, the sign of we're lost. We're not sure where we're going. And when I walked up, you knew they knew something was not quite right. And I looked at the map in their hand and it was blue. And we don't have blue maps in our park. And uh, they looked at me and the dad was shaking his head. The mom's like, where's Harry Potter? <laughs> and, and, and then she said, are we in the wrong park? And once again, one of the few moments in my life, I came up with it immediately instead of like three hours later, I said, ma'am, you are not in the wrong park. You just have the wrong map. <laughs> and I gave him a studio's map Boom. <laughs> and gave him some fast passes and said, this will get you on Toy Story. This will get you on Rock and Roller Coaster. This will get you on Tower of Terror. Don't go see that Harry Potter thing. You stay with us. We're going to make sure you have a great day. And we left it at that. And they laughed and they went on their way and the kids were happy and everyone was happy. So instead of me saying, no, you're in the wrong park, you know, and of course, giving them the look of like, how could you not know that? My, that's not my job. My job is to make them happy. And if they think they're looking for Harry Potter, my job is to say, you're not, but you're lucky you're here today because we're going to take care of you. So that respect thing is a, is a big deal. And, uh, you know, we just get very judgmental when we get, I, you know, I get caught up in operations. Uh, you know, why can't the guests go where we tell them to go? Why won't they read the sign? Why do they always ask where the bathroom is? We put signs everywhere. But when I go to a restaurant, I don't want to ask, I don't want to wander around the restaurant. I want someone to tell me where the restroom is and be nice about it. So anyway, it's, there's just a basic respect level I think you have to have and people really appreciate that. No, I agree with you to that one so much. And, and here's the other part to that. Is I, I feel that I've been to, where was it recently? I, I don't name names of places, but I went to somewhere, went somewhere recently and we had an experience where it felt like the associate working at the front desk just didn't realize that they were giving a bad reputation to the company because the idea is like, who cares? I'm, you're, you're annoying me. It was right. uh, it's a big department store. You can buy yeah. everything there for discount prices. <laughs> yeah. but they didn't re I have a greeter, but it doesn't always greet, but you can get great prices. <laughs> exactly. But they don't, the, the person didn't realize that I didn't understand. It was, a, we were buying, I know exactly what it was. 
it was a circumstance where I needed to get a money order really quick. And they, you know, somebody said, go there, you can get one really, really quick as opposed to going to the bank. So I just went there to get one and with some issues with the money order. And the person was just like, it almost, I felt like an idiot because I don't use money order all the time. <laughs> Right. And then also they made me, they gave me false information because right. they didn't know as well. And I just was like, this is so annoying. And I, my view of the organization just kind of continued to deteriorate, you know, but you go and you, you have to go. And, uh, but that person there really didn't see that her role or her conversation with me was reflective of the, the overall, you know, billions of dollars that they make or people. Sure. And I would, I'd, I'd take another, I'd come at that from another angle also. Even if, even if you really don't have pride working for the organization you're with, you need to take a personal pride and be a professional. And I, what, that's what I've learned at Disney over time is when you treat people professionally, they'll act professionally. And when you raise the bar, they'll raise the, the, that, the, the level they need to be. So I would almost say what you experienced wasn't that employee's fault. It was leadership's fault. Yeah. So either hiring them in an environment they shouldn't be in or not training them, or not giving them feedback, or not holding them accountable, or not rewarding and recognizing them, or not being present. And so, once again, leaders create the environments for their people, and then their people go and operate in that environment. And uh, I think it all starts with leadership. You know, when I'm at the supermarket and there's one register open, I've learned over time, don't give the cashier a hard time. They're working as hard as they can, and they're stuck out there. Go find the general manager or the manager and say, hey, what are you doing? You know, why aren't you out here? <laughs> and uh, and attention because they're, they're running the breaks. They're running the organization. It's not that cashier. So to your point is um, it's uh, that, that pride factor is pretty important. Love it, man. I, this is interview is going so much longer because this is so good, but I want to get to that fourth point. And yeah. uh, this is, you, you got me so far. So special treat them as individual respect. What's that last one there? All right. The next one is pretty straightforward, but once again, it's uh, underestimated. We don't always deliver it. Be knowledgeable. Know what you're talking about. In sales, obviously, when you know your product inside out and you believe in it and you really do believe it's going to bring value and help the person you're, you're selling to, your client, it is a lot easier to sell because they can hear the excitement in your voice. They can see the, the expertise you have. And when I talk to people who know what they're talking about, by the end, I'm like, all right, just tell me how much I need to buy and what I need to buy because just show me the way. And that's, that's, that's extremely important. So I think this idea is not only do you know, and I know, you know, in, in sales, I know there's the benefits of the product and the, the features and that kind of thing. But not only do you know that, but do you know how it's really going to, have you done a study of this company and say, look, I looked at your company and you have X whatevers. And if you brought this in, I think here's how it could help your, your employees. Here's how it could help your customer experience. And, you know, be able to tell that story and not only be knowledgeable about the product itself, but be able to take the next level about how implementing it is really going to help them. So once again, at Walt Disney World, if the fireworks are at 10 o'clock and I tell you they're at 11 and you have dinner and show up at 11 and they're done, there's not much we can do about that. You know, they've been shot for the night. <laughs> so we make sure our cast members are equipped with as much information as we can give them. But more importantly, we equip them with, here's the, the attitude you need to have is if you do not absolutely know the right answer, you go ahead and you look it up. You find someone who knows the answer. You dial zero and get the operator and they can tell you and just don't give people bad information. And if you don't know, tell people you don't know. And if you find yourself saying you don't know a lot, then you need to do some training or get some more training because that's just, that's just about you know, having savvy and, and knowing your product. And uh, people want us to be knowledgeable. There's lots of things to do at Walt Disney World. There's lots of experiences and people are looking for our advice a lot of times and they just want, the, you know, they want to know how much something costs. They want to know where something is and what time something happens. And they need to trust that we're giving them the right information. Oh man, you couldn't have said this any better. Like uh, I, I'm, 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 I love this and all of these things. Again, literally everything that you shared here, it doesn't require uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's just simple things that we could probably do, and uh, especially the last one, becoming knowledgeable, learning about your prospects industry. I think sometimes we go to a lot of our, you know, products, our product training courses, and that's great. And our product conference and industry conference, that's awesome. But if we go after a certain industry, it probably behooves me to go to a hospitality if that's where I'm focusing on as one of my area of hospitality conference. Or if I'm focusing on a medical field, maybe I should go to one of their medical conferences, hear what they're talking about, what's changing, so that I can co uh, combine what I'm learning with what's changing in their industry and I can provide more knowledge and more experience with the products or service that I have to offer. 
You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that takes you to the next level where you're having that people can tell that you, you're having an authentic conversation because whatever you're telling them didn't come out of the, the sales training manual. You went out and made an extra investment and you went beyond, beyond the data, beyond what was there to find out for yourself. When I go do keynote or uh, speeches or leadership workshops, I usually tell people if they're inclined to, I'd like to get there a day early and maybe have dinner with the senior leaders or spend time in their organization for a few hours, walking, talking to people. Because then when I get up to do my keynote, I can start using specific examples. So I know, you know, I know what I'm going to talk about in my keynote and I can get up in front of a group and I know where they're from and give a pretty good speech. But if I can spend a couple hours in their organization and maybe talk to their CEO, talk to what they're concerned about, what's on their mind, and then give that speech and then talk about people by name and talk about departments by name and talk about things they're dealing with by name, people, it just goes to another level. My credibility level goes up by tenfold. So um, it just takes a little bit of homework to go ahead and do that. And you can be way ahead of the game and differentiate yourself with a relatively small amount of investment of time. Love it, man. If there's one major takeaway you'd like folks listening to this episode to walk away with today, Dan, to help them close more deals, what's that one major piece of advice? Yeah. The only thing I'd say for today, because like I said, we were scratching the surface on kind of how we operate and things. But what I would say is just pick something from today's podcast. Pick one thing and start doing it and just change a behavior. Start doing something differently today and that you weren't doing yesterday. And that's going to be a little reminder that you can you can make changes and you're going to see the impacts of those changes. I use a term at a lot of companies is, and uh, it's funny when I, when I speak with the, the group from Mexico or my, the, the company I'm, I'm consulting with in Croatia, I talk about what's the best way to eat an elephant. And what I'm finding is most cultures don't know that phrase. Of course, in the United States, we know what the answer is, right, Donald? Just what's bit by bit, one piece bit at a time. Bit by bit, one bite at a time. And so people get overwhelmed. And when they hear all this, they say, well, it's too much. It's overwhelming. I can't do all these things. And I say, you don't do all these things. You change one thing. You say, okay, next sales call I make, I'm going to go online. I'm going to Google that company. I'm going to read three or four articles about their company, what their founding is, what, why they're in business, who founded them, and what's going on with them now. And I guarantee you, if you just make that one little change in the next sales call you go into, you're going to feel more comfortable. You're going to make a connection with them. People will be more likely to listen to you. So whether it's that or it's you know, figuring out five ways to make people feel special or eight ways I can treat them as individuals or how can I become more knowledgeable about my product, whatever it is, just do one thing today. And then you know, at some regularity, keep adding new behaviors. And that's how you get better. I love it, man. If folks out there want to get in touch with you to learn a little bit more about you, Dan, and some of the things you're doing, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah, you just go to uh, dancockrell.com. And uh, my, my email's on there. My cell phone number's on there. It's got a little background of some of the work I do. Uh, my wife and I work together and uh, she, she worked at Disney Institute for a while. So we're doing work, leadership workshops, keynote speeches. I do executive coaching. Every, every time I do something, it's a little bit different, but it's all around you know, management, leadership, and creating an environment that people can uh, get the maximum uh, performance. Love it, man. Well, Dan, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show today, bringing great wisdom, helping us to create these experiences. We appreciate it. Thanks. Really appreciate being here. And I wish everyone the best of luck in your sales endeavors. Awesome. Hey, if you didn't get one idea from this episode, I don't know what's wrong with you. Maybe you've heard of stuff like this before, but you probably haven't done it. Well, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and try it. You're hearing from a guy who was a former Walt Disney World executive. He knows they create this for a living. If you're serious about closing more deals, try these things. Test them out and let me know what works and if it didn't work for you. But I would wager to say it will work for you. If you want to learn a little bit more about Dan, if you want to connect with him, see some of the cool things that he's working on, and perhaps you can invite him to come into your company and do some training, I want you to go back to the show notes, thesalesevangelist.com slash the word episode number 1195. Again, thesalesevangelist.com slash the word episode number 1195. I hope this gave you a little bit of oomph as you go and start your Monday morning. I hope it gives you some insights, some ideas that you can try and start testing out at the beginning of the week. Tell me what works. Again, go back to the show notes or connect with me on LinkedIn, Donald C. Kelly. While you're at the show notes, make sure to check out TSC Certified Sales Training Program. We would love to have you join us. You can see the experience that we offer in that program. As well as check out Audible. They have an audio book that you could take and start listening to today. One that I absolutely love and it's called Sales Management Simplified. Find all the details again back in the show notes. 
I share stuff like this because I want to help you. I bring on guests like Dan because I know they're legit. I want you guys to find more of those ideal customers, the ones that's going to pay for your services or products. I want you guys to have more meaningful conversation. I want you to be able to close more deals. But most importantly is to challenge you to go out each and every single day and do big things. Hey, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. And also, if you haven't done so already, I ask you to go ahead and hit subscribe. It would be an absolute honor to have you leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It goes a long way. Folks are able to come back behind you, see your testimonial, and hit subscribe because of what you share. I would greatly appreciate that. Our show today was produced by myself and the Sales Podcast Network. It was edited and mixed together by the one and only Jershon O'Bale. Our show note today was created by Rael Ramirez. Our podcast guest coordinator is Mrs. May Mar. All of our podcast artwork and social media graphics was created today by Desin Cunado. Our podcast production manager is Mrs. Shannon Rasmussen. You can find audio credits to this and all of our episodes in each of our show notes. And as always, I am your host, your coach, your mentor, your guide down the sales journey, Mr. Donald C. Kelly, the sales evangelist. Sales Podcast Network.